going to be uh, monitoring this session to make sure that we're all OK and keep things in check. So, Ms. Pennell, are you there? I am. I'm here. Yeah. Can everybody hear me OK? We can indeed. OK, right. so um, do you want to, first of all, hand back over to Ben to carry on this, his story side of it and give some yeah. space and time? Uh, and then we'll get some questions later on. Um, I'm yeah. going to turn my camera off now because we're recording so you don't set my, see my face too much. And Ben, uh, I'll, I'll let you carry on. OK, thank okay. you, sir. All right. So, wanna... so if yeah. I just introduce, if that's OK, Mr Lesser, so these are some students from different year groups that we have from Scaresbrick Hall School. Um, some students as well don't have cameras. They'll be asking you questions on the microphone. Um, and they're studying history and religious education at GCSE. And they basically wanted to hear more about your story, ask you some key questions about different events and things that you were involved with. And it's very much just trying to learn more from your story based on what they want to find out, if that's OK. OK. Good. So if I can open it up to you just to introduce a bit about yourself and then we'll start the question and answering, if that's OK. Sure. Brilliant. So, okay. Thank you, sir. You start. Yeah. I, you, you know, um, you heard part of my story. Yeah. I am not going to be able to tell you the entire story, but I can start with Hungary. You know, from Poland, I finally ran away through ghettos and uh, how we were lucky in the uh, um, uh, double decker truck, how we were able to cross the border through that with that. But my parents who were supposed to follow my mother and father, as they were going into the truck, a farmer has seen them and they called the Gestapo and they came out and all 10 people were pulled out including the driver, the Polish driver who wasn't Jewish, and everybody was shot uh, at that time point. Um, from my whole family, only I and my sister Lola survived. The rest of the whole family, five of us, were, were just slaughtered, slaughtered by the Nazis for no reason at all, only because they were born Jewish. So you, you know about that ghetto in Bochnia, but I'll start with Hungary. Um, the, the rest of this beginning uh, takes too long, but I start with Hungary. Um, I just want to tell you one, one incident that happened to us in Poland, in Krakow, um, before we were, we had to evict Krakow. Uh, when these tanks came in, that you heard me tell about the tanks and the soldiers marching in and how the soldiers jumped out of the half track and they occupied the city. Five days after occupation, a truck pulls up to the gate to our where we lived at 5 a.m. and they were banging on the gate. The uh, Struch, which is the, um, uh, the, super, super. the super, came running out and opening the gate. What's going on? What's going on? All they wanted to know where the Jewish people live. And he was quick to oblige. He showed one side, the lessers, our family, and there was another side of the building. There was another young couple with two daughters about my age because we used to play in the yard after school, about my age. And then uh, the mother gave birth to an infant little boy about two months earlier. And these, these soldiers came running into our house and they started to pistol whip us while we were still in bed. This was 5 a.m. So they were first pistol whipping us and yelling. They had sacks in their hands and they were yelling that we should throw in all of our valuables. 
money, gold, jewelry, whatever they can find, they were throwing in. And they were beating up my father to open the safe. While my father is opening the safe, we hear this terrible screaming from the neighbors across the way, um, across the hallway. And my sister Lola and I ran out through the back door from the kitchen to run into their apartment through the back door in the kitchen, find out what's going on. And when we came in, this is what we saw. We saw this monster was holding the infant little boy by its legs and swinging it and yelling to the parents, make him shut up. He was screaming and crying. They kept, he kept swinging. Everybody is yelling, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. And you can see with a smirk on his face, he enjoyed what he was doing. He smashes the baby's head into the doorpost, killing it instantly. And, and it's something that keeps me up at night, just seeing that infant open head and what was going on on the floor. Everybody jumped on this monster. We jumped on him. But his friends heard what was going on. They heard the screams they, and they came running in and they pulled us off. They pistol whipped us all. They pulled us off and they told them, come on, Hans, let's go. They got to, they picked up all the stuff so they got together, all the money and, and gold and jewelry, whatever they had. They threw it in the truck and took off. This was only five days. Only five days. Anyway, afterwards, to make a long story short, you, we wound up in, in Auschwitz. Uh, they told us that everybody is going to be relocated to a camp in Germany. And, they, you know, they, uh, they told us the stories that everyone's going to be fine. The kids will go to school and the old people will be cared for and we arrived uh, after a few days. What we went through, 80 people in one cattle car without food and no room to sit because now everybody had bundles because they told us to bring along our valuables. So everybody had a bundle or a valise and they, uh, it was impossible. Because of these bundles, if somebody wanted to sit down, someone else had to stand up. And it was unbelievable. Some people were sick, old people, infants, pregnant women. Uh, you can't imagine the screaming, the yelling, one day, two day. And mind you, there was no water. They had two buckets of water when we went in there. And after the buckets of water was gone, there was no um, sanitary facilities. There were no toilets. Imagine, this is three days now. So we used those buckets. And after a while, those buckets filled up and they started to spill over. Now we couldn't sit on the floor anymore. Now we were glad we had bundles because we were sitting in bundles rather than on the human waste on the bottom. It was unbelievable. And the third night it arrived at the place and they opened up the doors and they ordered women and children to the right and men to the left. And they told us to leave all our belongings. Don't pick anything up. Just walk out, women and children to the right, man to the left. It was a very strange place. It was nighttime. And we see, um, we see the people in the striped clothes, inmates, who were directing us in different languages in case we didn't understand. And we were in line. Now, I had a choice. I could have gone with my sister and my little brother, but I was 15 and a half, and I wasn't a man yet, and I wasn't a child either. I decided to go with the man because I figured that this is a labor camp. 
then they'll feed you better if you work. They want you to labor, they'll feed you better. So this is what happened. I, uh, I went with the man and I'm holding on to my sister Goldie and her, my little brother Tully and we're just pulled apart, never to see each other again. They went directly to the gas chambers. And I am with my uncle and my cousin as we walk, we see strange things. Four or five buildings with flames are shooting up from the buildings and ashes are spewing all over. Every time you made a step, you left finger like a footprint in the ashes, just like in snow. Um, and this funny smell, the man in front of me were saying, oh, those places must be smelting factories. We will probably work there. No one had any ideas that the ashes are ashes from my loved ones or people or friends, family. Our loved ones, these are the ashes we are walking on. We had no idea then, but we, we came to a, a doctor, a man with a white frock and he had a white glove on. His name was Dr. Mengele. I didn't know his name. Later on, I found out, find out Mengele was considered as the angel of death. He decided who shall live or who shall die with a flick of his finger, just like that. Right, left, right, left. But every once in a while, he would ask a question. So when he came to, when we came very close to him, there was a young man and he asked him, comes to five kilometers laufen, can you run five kilometers or would you rather go by truck? The poor guy said he had a bad knee. He would rather go by truck. That was the wrong answer. He sent him to the right, to the gas chambers. Imagine, who knew? A doctor is asking you such a question. But to me, I was 15 and a half and I couldn't figure out. I see the barracks down the, all around us. Why would they ask such a question? Can you run five kilometers? I figured he's asking these questions to test you to see if you're strong enough to work. And it turned out to be just that. So I tell my uncle, my cousin, let me go first. And I went first in front of Mengele. I stretched myself out on my knees, my, my, on my toes, stretched myself up, saluted him and said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und arbeitsfähig. I'm 18 years old, I'm healthy and I can work. So he asked me, comes to five kilometers laufen, can you run five kilometers? I said, the wall, and I went to the left. Now, they took us then to, we, they marched us to a big brick building and they told everyone to get on the rest. What I didn't tell you is in Hungary, where my uncles and aunts and my, my oldest sister lived, my grandparents from my mother's side lived in Hungary, is that I told my uncle who invited me to stay in his house with my little brother. He had an, an other two sons and he was a wealthy man. He had a store where he was selling yardage good for suits and dresses and uh, he had a house above the store. So I told him, uncle, if the Nazis ever come in here, all your valuables, everything will be taken away. It would make a lot of sense if you can convert some of your assets into something tangible, something small that you can put in a pocket or hide it. And he listened to me. One day he came home with boxes of shoes and he gave a pair of beautiful black shoes for each member of the family. And he told us that in the heels of the shoes, there are diamonds. Use it only in a life-threatening situation if you can 
save your life, know that in the hills there are diamonds. And now we are in Auschwitz and I'm still wearing those shoes. And so is my uncle who gave it to me and my, his son, my cousin. But they told us to get undressed, to get undressed, leave all the clothes on the floor, walk out to these barbers. They were a bunch of barbers, uh, inmates with clippers and they cut your hair all over your body. But they told us to get undressed. So I got undressed naked, but I left my shoes on. My uncle who gave me his the shoes, he got out of the shoes and so does his son, my cousin. And I am the only one who decided that, no, oh, I'm not getting out of these shoes. There are diamonds in there. So I took, I walked up to the barbers with the shoes. They cut my hair. They didn't say a word. And then I went into the big room where they, uh, we had to take a shower there, a big shower room. And they had the spigots on top. And when they closed the door, some of the men started to scream. I didn't know why they were screaming, but some men knew that that the gas chambers, they have these water spigots, they look like water spigots, but instead of water, there's gas coming out. But when the water started to come out, once the water started to come out, it got quiet. We all took a shower, and then finally, after we, they gave us the striped clothes to wear, and they took us out to the barrack. I still have my shoes on, but uh, I changed it to the shoes that they gave me, wooden soles with canvas on top. I wore those shoes and I put my shoes under my jacket, under my arm, and I walked out. And we came to the barrack, the stube melt us that the man in charge of the barrack walks out, he counts us, and he, this is what he says to us. Huh, you Hungarian Jews, you think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes falling from them? Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you're told, this is how you're going to wind up ashes. Well, I couldn't believe what the, he just telling me. This is the 20th century. These are cultured, educated people. You mean they, they, my sister, my little brother, Ashes? They're killing people and, and I couldn't believe it. But we found out differently. And to tell you the story, what we found out there is unbelievable. And I found out from the Stubenmelters there who happened to be a Polish inmate, not Jewish, a Polish inmate. And he was so happy to hear me speak in his language. So he told me the whole story. I says, what's going on? Why do I hear that chanting or screaming or crying or, or yelling or, or singing? What is this? Uh, and what is this orange hue that we see on one side like flame? Ha, you Hungarian Jews, you know nothing. They were expecting you six months before Hungary was ever invaded by the Nazis. They made us dig ditches for the influx of the Hungarian Jews, fiery pits, they made us and they they added one crematorium and they added a, um, a a gas chamber they built just for the influx of the Hungarian Jews. And true, once the Hungarian Jews started to come in, there was one train after another lined up. They didn't have time to waste killing people in the gas chambers, so they put people in the gas chambers, and after only half that, once they were on the floor, quiet, 
they opened up the doors after 15 minutes, they opened up the doors and they told the Sonderkommando, the people who worked inmates, to take the people out after it was fresh, uh, le left open for about 15 minutes. They pulled everybody out and they were pulling out the gold teeth from the bodies, half dead bodies, pulling out the gold teeth, cutting their hair, and then they put him on on. They put him on. Uh, um, what do you call that? Stretchers. Stre no, they put him on um, stretchers or something, uh, like four or five people at a time, and they put rope around him, and they took him to the crematorium. But this was too slow of a process. Now decided, now they decided to throw these half dead bodies into dump trucks and they would take these dump trucks to these fiery pits and just dump him. But I said, what do I hear the screaming and crying or chanting? He says, ha, huh, Jechi, children, they couldn't be bothered with them. They have no gold teeth, they have no hair. They didn't even put the children into the gas chambers. Infants, they would put, throw them on top of these half dead bodies in the truck, and then they would dump him in this fiery pits alive. And this is the screaming that I heard in our, in our barrack. What we went through, what we went through in Auschwitz is too long of a story and I would I don't have enough time to tell you that but I highly recommend that you read my book highly recommend that um, if, from this point they brought in these trucks they put us in trucks and they took us to this labor camp which I told you earlier it was called um, um, of Dernhau. They took us to Dernhau, and uh, this is where they had the rock quarry, and all these things were happening. Um, one day, and of course, I got the 25 lashes, the beating, and uh, those other three people were killed. And because they, they, they were able to find those three inmates who escaped, uh, the killing stopped at this point. They only hung those three inmates, and then they told us to go back to our barracks. We can shower and so on. For weeks, I could not lay on my back because of the welts that I had all over my body. Uh, thanks God, everything healed up by now, so many years later. But um, one night we hear cannon fire, the front was closing in. When the front was closing in, that morning when we reported to go to work, there was a loudspeaker that said, nobody is going to work today. The whole camp is going to be evacuated. So line up in rows of five, which we did, rows of five, and we, they started to march us out. My uncle was already in the kitchen. He was working in the kitchen. Uh, there was a whole story behind it. I had to bribe with my diamonds. I had to bribe the kitchen chef to give my uncle a job because I figured he would never survive working in that rock quarry. It was very hard work. So anyway, but he was already in the kitchen working and I and my cousin were lined up and we, they marched us out. I've never seen or heard anything from my uncle again. And now we're going on the death march. Why they call it the death march is because if you could not keep up pace with the soldier, they shot you. And all day you can hear pop, pop, pop. People are being shot. And they left you right on the ground there on the road. Um, unbelievable. We've seen people from other groups that were marching with dead people lying already from the other groups. 
unbelievable. And, and they walked us one week after the second week, my shoes fell apart. My cousin who was with me, his shoes fell apart and there was snow on the ground. And we had to march. We had to march fast along with the soldiers. If we slowed down, they would shoot us. So here, actually just with, with a burlap around our feet, we were marching on top of snow and we had to do it fast. And my cousin was very weak and I dragged them along for another week. And after that, we arrived in Buchenwald. Buchenwald is a concentration camp. And when we arrived, they lined us up, they counted us, they told us to go into this barrack and they're going to feed you there. You're going to take a shower. And when, but tomorrow morning, you have to be back on the same spot at 8 a.m. because the camp is also be, being evacuated. Buchenwald is also being evacuated. So this is what happened. We went in and they did feed us. They gave us food, not too much, but they gave us some food. And then we took a shower. They gave us fresh clothes. We got dressed. We slept a little bit. In the morning, we had to go out and we lined up again. They counted us. They marched us out. About 300 yards out of the camp, we see cattle cars lined up and they lined us up and counted us 80 to a cattle car and they told us to march in. So I tell my cousin, I says, look, um, I remember going to, da to Auschwitz from Hungary in the cattle car and we were in the middle, it was terrible. I says, find a place against the wall so that we can rest our back on it, which he did. He, I pushed him up, he found a spot, and a spot for me, I went next to him, and we had pretty good spots where we can rest our back against the wall, when all of a sudden, um, the doors closed, and a half hour later, it opens up again, and they threw in 80 breads, a breath for each person. So imagine those people who were next to the door were grabbing three or four breads. And my cousin and I were against the wall. We had nothing. We don't know where we're going, for how long. I knew I had to go find the bread. So I started to climb over the heads of the sitting inmates and one inmate had a pocket knife. He didn't like the idea and he stabs me. I feel a stab in my chin here. And I feel it's blood is full in my mouth, but I have to go to get a bread. I need it. So I climb and I climb and this man was holding about five or six breads. I pull one bread out of him and he punches me. I put the bread in my back pocket and I walked back. Well, I didn't walk. I crawled over the heads of the people back to my cousin. My cousin takes a look at me. He says, Ben, what's happening? You're bleeding. I put my finger here. It went right through my tongue. It was right in a bad spot. But to this day, I still have a mark but obviously you won't be able to see it on this. My mark is over my chin because I filled up my, when I was that skinny, it was over the middle of my throat, but now it might pulled up. So now they closed the gate again and the train started to move. I had one breath between the two of us and some people had nothing and others had three or four breads. Those with a lot of breads started to die because they didn't have enough liquid to digest it. So they started to die. And then other people died and most people had no bread at all. 
and they kept dying in one week, two weeks. But I had this one bread and I rationed it between my cousin and I, the size of a half a neck every night in the middle of the night so no one can see me because if they knew I had bread, they would kill me for it. So this is what I did. Two weeks passed and all the bread was gone. We, the train was going for another week, three weeks. Almost everybody is lying dead. They all die. And we arrived to a place called Dachau. When we arrived to Dachau, they opened up the gate and they said, anyone who can walk, walk out through the tracks and go into this gate to the camp. So I'm holding my, my, my cousin and we limp in and there were maybe another two or three people coming out, uh, coming out of the uh, uh, wagon, of the cattle car. Imagine there were 80 going in and maybe three or four when I came out. And three days later, we are liberated by the Americans. We, they put us in a barrack next to the crematorium where we saw a mountain full of dead bodies waiting to be incinerated. And I, I, I was laying on the floor with my cousin. And one day, two days, on the third day, we hear screaming, yelling, Bafrayim, Bafrayim, liberation, Americans, Americans. So I tell my cousin, come on, let's go out and see what's going on. So he, holding him, we go outside and we see inmates are crawling on their hands and feet and kissing the boots from the GIs. And the GIs were, they never saw anything like that. They couldn't believe what they saw. These, these are human beings. They looked like a skeleton in walking and kissing their boots. And one, two GIs walk up to me and to my cousin and they open up a can of Spam, which they took out from the magazines from the German warehouses. And they open it up and it smelled so good and they hand it to me. Well, my cousin and I made a mistake. We ate some of it. And as we ate some of it, both of us got very sick. We got dysenteria. Unbelievable, you find out what dysenteria is. We got very sick. That evening, that night actually, my cousin dies in my arms. And I talk to him and he dies in my arms and I won't let him go. I keep talking to him. A man comes over and he saw what happened. He picks up my cousin, he takes him away. And I followed. As I followed, I make five or six steps and my knees gave out from under me and I just collapsed and I fell. As I fell, they pushed me to a side and I lay there till the evening. In the evening, a man walks over to me, nicely dressed. He introduces himself as a Jesuit priest. And he came with nuns and doctors from France and they're opening up a field hospital in Dachau in their yard. And he's gonna take me there. He picks me up like a sack of bones, which I was. I only weighed about 55 or 60 pounds the most. And, and he puts me on the shoulder and he carries me to the infirmary. On the way, he told me something I'll never forget. He says, Benek, what you went through because you were born to a Jewish family, Jewish, it's unbelievable. So unjust. This should have never happened. But he says, don't you ever abandon your noble religion. 
Now to hear that from a Jesuit priest in 1945 was almost unbelievable. And I remembered that. And he put me inside the, the uh, inside there was a, a bed, like a cot with a white sheet on it. He laid me down and none came over, took my vitals and I passed out. Two months later, I woke up in Santa Tillian. Santa Tillian was a monastery in Bavaria, not too far from, from um, um, Munich, not too far from Munich, maybe an hour car ride. So this is where I woke up. And the nuns saw me open my eyes, they're yelling. He's, he's alive, he's up, he's up, he's up. And he, they called all the other nurses and they called the doctors in. And anyway, this is where I was born two months later in Santa Tillian in a monastery in Bavaria. If you have any other questions, by all means, start to ask. I could go on, but I know I'm limited in time. Thank you so much, Mr. Lasser, for that detail. I mean, watching the children listening to the story, I hope that they've learned so much just by listening to somebody that had first-hand experience. Because again, we can teach in class, but it's it's so amazing that you've been able to share these experiences with them, and I'm sure they're so grateful. Um, so what I'd like to do now, if it's okay, I'm gonna ask for some students to give you some questions now to respond to. Certainly. Brilliant. So if I can ask Dominic first, please, for your question. Uh, hello, Mr. Lasser. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. Uh, and I just wanted to ask what your opinions of Simon uh, Wissenthal were and what he did after the war. My opinion, he did a great job. I uh, certainly um, I honor this man, of course, he's no longer with us, but what he did uh, needed to be done. Need, someone had to do it. And uh, he was a big hero as far as I'm concerned for devoting his life and going after these Nazis. Thank you, Dom. Um, Neve, are you there with your question? Yeah, hi, Mr. Lasser. Um, I was just wondering how you and your acquaintances kept morale high during what happened. Thank you. Uh, we didn't have a morale high. Our morale was, wasn't very, very good. You can't say it was a high morale, but we knew, most of us knew we have to be good in whatever we do uh, to survive. Uh, some people were too weak and they gave up. Others did exactly what they were, they were told. And I am a big believer on whatever you do, you do the best you can. So it didn't matter whether I had a sledgehammer and I was breaking up boulders or whatever else I did, I had to do it right so that not to give them an excuse to hit me or kill me. And, and this is, I guess, how I survived. I still believe, I still believe in that, whether you're working today for another company, uh, whatever your profession is or will be, I can only advise you always make sure that whatever you do will help the company survive, that they will flourish. That because if your bus, uh, your company survives, you will benefit by it too. So always see what you can do to be the best in the professions that you are in. It doesn't matter what it is. Well, whatever you do, be the best. And that was my motto. And that's how I think I succeeded because 
of that idea. Anybody Brilliant. else? Thank you for that, Mr. Lesser. Um, can I ask Lewis to give his question next, please? Uh, hello, Mr. Lesser. I just wanted to say thank you very much for speaking to us today. Uh, my question is, what did what effects did the events of the Holocaust have on your faith and whether or not it strengthened your beliefs? Well, I lost my faith. I come from a very orthodox family, um, religious. But I lost my faith. I lost my faith when I saw what was going on. How can there be a God and allow this to happen? Women, children, babies, infants, throwing them a life into fiery pits. This is the 20th century. And how can a God allow this to happen? So yes, I lost my belief, but lately, I picked it up again, and I'm I'm not rel that religious, but I am a believer. I believe in a God, and I'll tell you why. God gave us all free will, and once he gave us free will, we have the right to decide what we want to do with that, be good or be bad. And if those people wanted to be killers, because he gave us free will, he can't interfere. If he interferes, there's no free will. I mean, this is my reasoning why I feel, yes, there must be a God. This whole thing, what's going on in this world, in this beautiful world we live in, didn't just happen by accident. There is something or a God that's leading this. This is my opinion now, but during the war, yes, I lost my faith completely. And it took a long time for me to regain it again. Thank you, to Mr. Lesser, for being so honest with that reply. Um, can I ask, Alicia, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Can you ask your question for me? Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, I was just wondering, what was the most challenging part of the camps? I, d I didn't the understand question? it. The, I Sorry. didn't understand the what question. What was the most challenging part of the camps? The most challenging part of the camp was surviving every hour. Living another hour was a big challenge. Not alone a day. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah. Ella, are you there? What? Sorry. Ella? OK, no problem. Um, Amelia, uh, have you given your question for yeah. me? Hi. Hi, Mr. Lesser. Um, did you ever manage to desensitize your experiences, bear in mind it was so traumatic? He doesn't understand the question. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you ever manage to desensitize your experiences? Because obviously it was so traumatic. Did you ever find a way to overcome what you'd experienced? Well, it's human nature that you want to live. And I was young. I was only uh, liberated at the age of 16, and I certainly wanted to live. So is that what motivated me is not to give up, not to give up in life. All you had to do is give up. If you were pessim pessimistic in any way, chances are you wouldn't survive another day. But you had to uh, think that you will survive and be pos positive about it. 
I guess I always have a positive outlook on life. Thank you, sir. Um, I think Ella's with us now. Ella, would you like to ask your question? Um, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I know you've gone into some um, detail about this, but um, what happened when the concentration camp was liberated in 1945 and how did you feel? Very good question. I, I guess, I don't know how I felt. I guess we were all happy um, that the killing is going to stop. But remember one thing. I was liberated in Dachau. And when you take a picture, when you see the, the film, the photograph, you see a lot of inmates jumping for joy and they were happy. Uh, they were liberated and they were screaming and yelling for happiness. The Jewish, those were not the Jewish people. Those were um, inmates usually uh, political inmates that were against the Nazis or something, but they were not Jewish. Those people had a home to go back to. They had somebody waiting for them to embrace them and hug them and be and welcome them. We Jewish people had no place to go. We had no home to return to. We had no uh, family. I was waiting out there to give you a hug or a kiss, nothing. We were just left to fend for ourselves. So, yes, while we were happy that the killing is going to stop, at the same time, they, we had this feeling that what now? What's next? What can we do now? But I personally wasn't that involved. I passed out. I passed out and I was out, out of it for two, two months. So I don't know how I got to Santa Tillion, who took me there or anything. I don't know any of this, but this is where I woke up. So yes, uh, most of the people liberated were very happy uh, and they had places to go to. They had family who were waiting for them. We had nobody. So we were left to fend for ourselves. We had no um, family to hug and, and, and look forward to meet some members of the family because we felt that everybody was killed. When you see these mountains full of dead bodies everywhere you go, and they're all Jewish. They were born Jewish. That was the biggest crime. So you know, you know the hatred has to stop. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, sir. Um, can I ask Harry to give his question next, please? Hi, Mr. Lesser, uh, thank you for uh, telling your story. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, my question was, what is your opinion on prosecuting modern day neo-Nazis? Yes, Harry. Uh, my opinion is it's the right thing to do. In fact, I was a witness brought from Las Vegas to Germany to witness um, I was witnessing Try one it. of the um, guards from Auschwitz was caught and he, he lived his whole life and he, in Germany, no one knew about him, but he was a guard in Auschwitz. So they had me come from America to testify against him. So I was in Germany testifying against a Nazi guard. And of course, he was convicted, but he was 93 years old. So what are they going to do with him? And they had him under house arrest. 
and uh, he died within a couple of years. But yes, to answer your question, uh, they have to be. Um, they have to be. Uh, uh, when they, they have to be. Um, Tried. What do you call it? They, we have to. Um, the Nazis have to be. Um, uh, to, to put it simple, today there aren't any left. I don't think there are any of these perpetrators left. I want you to know something. I don't have a problem with the German people. I am on, I'm only against the perpetrators of the Holocaust. And most of them died by now or are dead already. But the children or grandchildren, they're lovely people, just like people like you and I. And I I go to Germany very often and I speak in high schools in Germany. I've been there several times with my daughter, Gail. Um, so I have friends German friends to this day, but the only ones that I am against is those perpetrators of the Holocaust. Thank you, Harry. Um, can I ask Hattie, please, to give her question? Hmm. Sorry, um, Hattie, I think your microphone's on mute. Is it working now? Yes, perfect. Hello, Mr. Lesser. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I thought it was incredibly moving. Um, I wanted to ask you, what life lessons did you learn during your experience in the concentration camps? What life lessons I'd learned is the same thing. Stop the hatred. We have to live side by side and appreciate our differences rather than hate them. We're all God's creations. And this is what I learned, to love my neighbors, to love everybody, unless they give me a reason to, to not to love them. I didn't have any person that I can say that I hate, except when it comes to Nazis who are still around. Those Nazis were the perpetrators of the Holocaust. And I can't understand it. It just doesn't penetrate how a, a, a young soldier can pick up an infant and smash their head into a doorpost and then go home to his family. And those are cultured people, people who went to school like you and I, and they went to high school, they went to college, and killing was just like, like killing a fly. Killing a Jew it didn't mean anything. You can't imagine, even in Krakow, Poland, they had curfews. And we had to be in our house at 7 p.m. and until 7 a.m. the following day. And if you dared to walk out earlier, because the, the Gestapo was all over uh, checking, checking people, there was no judges or juries in Poland and, or even jails for Jewish people. If you if you disobeyed any of the ordinances, there was only one penalty for the Jewish people. That was death. Right on the spot, they shot you. And when you woke up in the morning, you went outside on the street, you saw a lot of people, people over the, all over, and people were going around with push carts and picking up these dead bodies.
Thank you, sir. I'm just going to offer a couple more questions, if that's OK, because I don't want to keep you for too long. You, um, you, you can ask all the questions you want. I'm oh, here. Thank you, sir. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> um, can I ask Beth Ann, please, to give her question next? Hi, it's really inspirational to be able to speak to you. Um, my question is, what are your main memories of the soldiers who liberated you? The memory of the soldiers, no. Uh, I, I do have memory, not from the, at, at liberation, you know, I passed out right away. So I don't have a memory of those soldiers. But later on, um, I made a film. They filmed me, it was called... The Liberators. The, it was called The Liberators. And it showed a film where three liberators of Dachau and three survivors of Dachau are in that film. I am one of the survivors. And these three liberators came out to meet me as a survivor. Uh, and we met several times, so I got to know them. They were wonderful people. In fact, one of those liberators was a German Jewish man who lived in Dachau, in the city of Dachau. He lived there. And he was able to get a um, visa to go to the United States before the war broke out. But when he was only 17 years old, he lied and he enlisted. When he heard the, the war broke out, he enlisted uh, in the army. Um, they only took people from 18, but he lied. He said it was 17. And he came back and he liberated Dachau. And he, of course, was born there and he knew everybody he knew. But imagine he was telling the story and, and he passed away already. I'm sorry, he was an old, older than I. Um, but yes, um, I, I personally don't remember very much the, who liberated me in person. I remember the soldier walk, two soldiers walking up, giving me a can of spam, but I don't remember their faces. This is after we ate it, uh, you know, I passed out a day later and I was in, I, I, I was in coma. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. And um, Poppy, can I ask you to ask your question next, please? Hello, Mr. Lesser. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. My question is, if you could travel back in time and tell your younger self anything, what would, what would you tell him? If I could tell uh, who? Yourself. If you could tell young Ben at 11 years old, 12 years old, what would you tell him, knowing what you know today? Okay. I would tell him to be brave and I don't know, at the age of 11, uh, I, I had no idea what to expect. I'm sure my parents knew because Kristallnacht happened a year earlier. But I don't know what I would tell myself. Uh, I be, you lived from day to day, from hour to hour, and uh, tried to survive. To, to, you know, every person has a will to survive. And this was my, I had a will to survive. No one wants to die. So I did tell myself, though, Ben, whatever they ask you, be sure you do it the right way and do it well. So that you don't give them an excuse to kill you. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Um, Maya, are you there with your question, please? Hi, yes. 
Hello, Mr. Lesser. I'd like to personally thank you for sharing your story. Since my great grandparents, uh, they are from Warszawa in Poland, and they were supposed to be sent down to Auschwitz, but instead were sent to a labor camp and were liberated. So I truly understand what it feels like to be in that position and scared because if I, my great grandparents were on a different train, I wouldn't be here today, so thank you. And um, my question is for you, what kinds of other people are at the camp and which one of their stories stuck with you the most? Well, I'll tell you, in the camp, most of us kept to ourselves. We didn't talk much about stories. Yes, I heard a lot of stories from different uh, inmates, but none of it was good. It was always it had to do with, oh, they almost killed me. They almost uh, did that and they almost killed me. I, I worked there. I, I worked my uh, butt off and I'm tired and I'm sick. Most people were just too sick to talk. They we didn't, we didn't discuss anything, but um, I can't, I don't remember anyone telling me his story in the camp. I mean, we were all so involved with getting through another, living through another hour, another day. It was just impossible to talk, to sit down and talk to each other uh, like human beings. When, when we had a little extra time, we tried to sleep so we have enough strength for the next day. But I don't, I don't, you know, everyone has a will to survive. So to tell you uh, what I remember from other stories, I don't. I don't remember. I remember talking to my cousin and my uncle, um, sure, but we talked about family matters mostly, um, nothing about the camps. You know, in the camps, you never knew what's going to happen the next day. You did a job, you got a little bit of a ration, a little food, you never knew what to expect. The next day, they could just decide to kill you. Thank so you. Mr. Sorry, okay. Mr. Lasser, carry on. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to introduce Aidan to give his next question, if that's OK. Hello, Mr. Lasser. Thank you for sharing your very personal experiences with us. I just wanted to ask you, last week, there were news articles reporting on an American survey of a thousand young adults aged 18 to 39. They were asked questions about the Holocaust. According to the survey, almost a quarter believed that the Holocaust was a myth or had been exaggerated or they were not sure about it. How can students who have learned about the Holocaust help to tackle this ignorance? Well, you should be aware of the truth. I think those people who want to know the truth know the truth. Those people who deny the Holocaust do it purposely because nothing in history has ever been as documented as the Holocaust. Eisenhower was smart enough when he liberated Dachau or other camps and he saw what was going on. He was instructing his soldiers, take pictures. He said, because someday the world is going to say that this never happened. They'll, they'll say it's, a, it's exaggerated, it's, it's a myth take pictures. And the truth is there are so many pictures. And and the irony is that even the German government doesn't deny it. And not only don't they deny it, but they actually have a list of almost all the people that they killed. They have they have archives with with folders and folders of names of people that were killed. And this is in Germany. Now, the Germans don't deny it. Why would this person deny it? He has an ulterior motive. 
the motive is if you they figure if they tell a lie long enough, some people will believe it. You can't tell anyone that there was no Holocaust or even that it was exaggerated. My Sorry, Mr. Lester, I think your microphone's on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect, sir. Thank you. OK, so anyway, the answer to that is uh, it's it's not true. Uh, you should uh, know wh how to counteract the, how, what to tell a person like that, because those people know the truth. There isn't a person that could possibly claim that the Holocaust didn't happen or that the Holocaust exaggerated. There is a list of human beings that were killed. My family, five members of my family were slaughtered by the Nazis. And, and there is a list, their name, you can find their name in Germany. So it's not like it's, it's never happened or it's exaggerated. But you have to know how to answer these people. Know that these people know the truth where they're trying to, uh, to get other people to ask questions, make them not believers, and then say, oh, it's, they're, they're exaggerating, and they're minimizing the Holocaust. This is why I started the foundation called Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. The foundation Zahor means remember. Remember, I, I feel I won't let the world to try to forget. My parents, remember us. We were here. We were here in this world. Don't forsake us a second time. So the answer to that is, of course, he knows he or she who told you that know the truth. And the problem we're having today is because, because of uh, the internet, and it's so easy, um, just as the easy for me to tell my story, but there are so few of us left. To, to really to tell the truth. And these neo-Nazis come around and they tell you these lies over the internet. And it spreads to millions of people all over the world. So they have an easy way to try to convert the world. Oh, there was no Holocaust. Oh, they're exaggerating. Not, not six million didn't die. They're exaggerating. They didn't kill babies or children. Come on. The truth is that the Germans have all of this. Every member that they killed are in, in these files. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Um, Elizabeth, can I ask you to give your question next for me, please? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And um, thank you for sharing your experience. It's an incredible experience. I'm very sorry for what happened to you. And um, what was the scariest part of happened to you in the concentration camp? And how did you cope with it? What uh, happened to me? What's the scariest part that happened in the concentration camp? And how did you deal with it? The scariest part was the 25 lashes. Because I saw three people ahead of me were killed. Who, this was the scariest part because I figured I'm not going to survive this. But I talked to myself and I said, Ben, you have to do it the right way and survive it. Imagine you have to stand, you have to stand on your 
uh, tiptoes, put your knee inside the opening of the sawhorse, bend over without touching the two by four, and count. If you miscount while they're hitting you, you miscount, you start from one again. So some people were hit more than 25 times, um, but most of them did not survive. All three of them were shot and I am next. So that was really very, very important. It was, it was the scariest time in my, my whole life. I felt at that point, I wasn't too sure that I will survive this, but I'll do my best. And being the youngest, I guess uh, that was in my favor. I was so young and I was able to, to follow uh, these instructions and do it right. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Um, Grace Johnson, are you there? Who? Don't. Is Grace there? Okay, I'll come back to you, Grace, because I'm not quite Sorry. sure. Oh, it's all right, Grace, don't worry. Do you want to so, give your question to Mr. Lesser? Something's gone weird with my background, sorry. It's okay. Thank, thank you so much for sharing your story, not just with us, but with everyone. Um, my question is, how has your experience changed the way you look at everyday life? How I look at daily life? Is that yes. the question? How did your experience change the way you look at daily life? Yeah. Well, it changed me in a way that I love my family and I usually love almost everybody that I come in contact with. In my business, um, this was uh, noticeable. People who did business with me felt that I'm sincere and I really liked every person in this world. I love them unless they turn out to be different than they should be. But every person to me is God's creation and I treat them as such. I treat them as such and whether it's business or or of business or personal or fun or whatever, um, I respect my people. And I, all I can tell you is th the hatred has to stop. We have to learn to take care of each other. Or if you don't, at least, at least, don't hate. Don't hate. Why? You know, all these things that happens in, in even today, you hear these people are shot or these people were killed, the killings that's going on. It's all has to do with hatred. And thank you, I, Mr. Lesser. Yeah. And we just have one more question, if that's OK, because um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, can I ask Stevie to give your question, please? Hi, Mr. Lesser. It's um, an yes. honour and a privilege to speak to you today, and I'm extremely grateful. My question is, what do you believe we can do to fight indifference, hatred, racism and anti-Semitism today? I didn't understand. Um, what do you need to do today to stop hatred, anti-Semitism? Okay, that was a very good question. I just didn't quite understand everything you said. You have a very nice accent, uh, Stephanie. Um, what can you do today? You important thing is you can stop the hatred. That has to stop and treat every person that you know, your friend, 
school body, but doesn't matter, with respect. There's the way you would like to be treated yourself, treat them with respect. And, and that's all I can tell you about this. Uh, it, it's very important. Um, it, it's important to stop the bullying and you have to have tolerance for other people. The bullying is the worst thing you can do because when you do that, you're, you're making an, you, you're actually, you're making an enemy. And you don't want to grow up, come out of school that has enemies waiting for you. But some people uh, like to bully, bully. They feel they're superior in any way. That has to stop. And if you see somebody being bullied, try and, and help those people if you can. I'll tell you what, when I speak in schools, one particular school went out, the teachers went out and they bought a bench. They put a bench in the hallway and I and they, named the bench Ben Lesser Bench. When I asked, what is it for? So she was telling me, if a child is being bullied or they feel bad for any reason at all, they go and they sit on that bench. And since it's on the main hallway, any teacher that comes by has to stop and has to uh, counsel that child, find out why and, and see if they can counsel. It was such a great idea that they, they went out and then and they bought another one the following year, another bench with my wife's name on it. So, so we had a Ben bench and a Jean bench and people could, they liked the idea, but I think it's something very important. You have to uh, learn to to like the, to get along with people. The hatred has to stop. When you go home today, make sure to hug every member of your family. Tell them that you love them, even Thanks. though sometimes sometimes. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you're a little angry at your brother or your sister for whatever reason. Um, don't be, don't be. Just walk over and give her, him or her a hug and say, I love you. It's so important. And whatever that person did, is not, he's not going to do it again if you, uh, Embrace him and you say, I love you. It's very important. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. And on such a lovely message, um, I hope it's OK, but I'm going to bring an end to this question and answer session. That was so amazing. And I'm sure all the children are really grateful. So I'm just going to express our thanks. Some of those answers were so insightful. So thank you for your time, Mr. Lesser. We really very much appreciate it. And Good evening. Thank you so much for speaking to us. What can I say something? Of course, sir. Yeah. I I urge you to buy my book, not because I want to sell books, but there's so much you're going to learn in the, my books. And also, you can you don't want to buy the book, go to my curriculum, which I which is open for everybody. And in the curriculum, you're going to find my story. You're going to find all the answers, I believe, that you are asking. They're right there. Um, and I even have a um, uh, hologram or of some, what, what do you call Artificial it? Artificial intelligence. A, a uh, intelligent? Artificial intelligence. Oh, artificial intelligence. I, I have to learn that um, you can see it on my website 
when you go to the Zahor Foundation, you can see my liking sitting there in a the chair and you can ask me a question and I will answer it to you, even though uh, I may be gone already. This may be 10 or 20 years from now or 20, 30 years from now. I'll always be there. You can ask me questions and I'll answer it. I, I feel good that I was able to do these things. And uh, I, I, I ask all of you to share my story. So it lives on. And we'll do that with great pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for sharing it. If I just pass this over to Mr. Shaw, if that's OK. Hi, Ben, again. I've got to say thank you very much for everything you've done. Uh, we are going to be committed now to taking your story and sharing it around the world and pushing it out further using technology so that everyone hears these answers, hears these questions, and we won't stop until we keep sharing it. Uh, we have access to your book. We're promoting the ZachorLearn.com website, and we're going to make sure that all of our students here know how to download the book, Living a Life That Matters. You can download it from Amazon on the Apple Store. We can buy copies here to distribute as well, and we'll do that. So you can read the whole story and learn about that. And it may even become part of our curriculum that we promote as well to read that book, to understand that and the stories from there that help us to learn. Um, I, I feel very humbled to spend time with you today. And I've, I've been with you, Ben, now since about four o'clock UK time. And we're getting on towards, I, I guess, half seven here. And you've committed a huge part of your day to share your story. Um, I wish you every blessing for your family and your life. And the Zakor Foundation, we will support that in what we're doing as well. And I thank you from the bottom of our heart, from our whole school, from our global community as well. Thank you very much. OK, I thank you uh, for for doing this. This is very important. We have we have to keep the memory alive and you're helping. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for listening to me. It's a pleasure, Ben. Have a wonderful day. And also, I know behind the scenes there we have somebody else helping out as well. Uh, I can hear the prompts coming in. And so, hey, hey here you are. Yeah. Thank you very much, OK? And, and, yeah. I know <laughs> Gail's been wonderful. She is my she is my right hand. <laughs> Gail, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much for helping out. And, and we'll share all the stories with you and have a fight out. And have a great day, guys, OK? Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Oh,